I'd like to begin by thanking Professor Packer for his very generous invitation to speak today and to congratulate CLO on its 15th anniversary. I'm very proud also to represent South Africa and indeed to represent my own journals, all of which are open access journals and which have been judged meritorious enough to be hosted in CLO. My task is to discuss the future of peer review and to some degree um, some of my thunder has been stolen during the course of yesterday and today. But I thought to ask two questions. Is there a future for peer review? Of course, that is very largely a rhetorical question. The title of my talk is indeed that peer review ensures and assures the quality of our publications. And then I ask the question, what will be the shape of peer review into the future? And I might indeed have called my talk the wisdom of the crowds replacing the wisdom of the few. To borrow uh, something from a debate on peer review which was carried in nature a few years ago. So who are the few? They're actually an elite and we heard uh, yesterday of how precious but also vulnerable they are of clinicians, of clinician scientists, of basic scientists who very often are academics and who work in a very narrow field sometimes of research. We rely on them as editors to offer us their wise advice and fortunately they get it right most but not all of the time. We're all familiar with the, 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 the traditional process, this wisdom of the few process, and I've chosen the Lancet. The author submits a paper. Uh, in the case of the Lancet, that passes through an in-house triage committee, and if fortunate, the paper is sent for review. In the case of the Lancet, to six reviewers and a statistician. Invariably, some degree of revision is called for, and there then is a conversation between the editor and the author, and ultimately the paper is published. The author has his or her reward. So we're talking then of pre-publication, traditional peer review, and we're relying on the wisdom of the few to ensure that scientific error is filtered out, that poor quality work is rejected, and that the new work is placed in its rightful context, that the limitations are acknowledged so that there is no over-interpretation, and the peer reviewers will know generally what is right for the readership of the particular journal. Richard Smith, former editor of the BMJ, stated, however, that the process is a deeply flawed one, and yet it is at the heart of science and journals. Flawed because it is slow, it is expensive. We heard yesterday of the time that reviewers put into the work of undertaking peer review. It may be inefficient, in that authors may not accept rejection, but simply, and nor indeed the reviewers' comments, but simply cycle to other journals until they are published. It's an inconsistent process, and I chose The Lancet because you need six peer reviews for statistical consistency, and there are very few journals that can offer that. This traditional process is accused of blocking innovation, and there are many examples. The most topical one of all, perhaps, is that of Peter Higgs, 
of the Higgs mechanism, who in 1964 offered his paper to a physics journal, was rejected on the basis that his work would have no interest to other physicists. He fortunately persevered, published in another physics journal, the rest is history. He was awarded the Nobel Prize a fortnight ago. It is accused of being biased. We heard yesterday of the difficulty that non-English papers have in gaining publication. It may be open to abuse. And there are spectacular examples of how peer reviewers fail to determine fraud. So what of the future? Should we abandon peer review completely? Should we simply rely on an editor to say yes or no to an author? Well, I would suggest, and I'm sure you would agree emphatically no, and I'll give you an example that is close to my South African heart in this regard. Duisburg in 2009 published his assertion that the HIV virus was not the cause of AIDS in medical hypotheses on the strength of the editor's acceptance. And of course this was grasped by my then president of South Africa and for 10 years, antiretroviral therapy was denied South African citizens. And it's reckoned that maybe a half million people died unnecessarily. So clearly that's not possible. What about relying just on triage by, at the hands of a small editorial committee? Well, this is similarly risky given the complexity of science. It's very unlikely that a small company, a small editorial committee, would have the depth and breadth to make a secure decision. In terms of the future, there are many that assert that new work ought to be nested in a Cochrane collaboration type systemic, systematic review. But of course this is cumbersome and unlikely really to be possible for most work. We as editors are able and indeed do commission editorials in order to contextualize new findings. There is a great call for open peer review. That is to say the reviewers are known, named and their affiliations known to the authors. This is not new. The BMJ undertook research to confirm in 1999 that this did nothing to detract from the quality of the reviews. Indeed, it possibly enhanced them, certainly would have made them more civil. And, but I do worry that smaller journals, such as my own, with much smaller pools of reviewers, would be able to sustain this model. However, we might be rescued by what we have heard about yesterday and throughout today, and that is the power of the internet and the networked environment that it offers us. So here then is replacement of the wisdom of the few by the wisdom of the crowds with identification of peer as broadly as possible. And we've heard this afternoon of the power of the PLOS journals and that model, disruption is their watchword, and we've heard that the criterion for publication is originality of the work. It's interesting to look at, and the former speaker I think hinted at something akin to this model in relation to the efficiencies that might be achieved within his own publications. A paper that um, brings, that, that is called the game of papers, this is the economist's title for the paper, that announced the formation of this collaboration or consortium between the journals hosted by PLOS, eLife, about which we heard earlier today. 
the European Molecular Biology Organization and Biomed Central. And what this achieves is not so much that a paper is published or not, rather that it is published um, by a system of peer reviews that are interchanged between the journal titles and ultimately the correct journal is found in which the particular publication deserves uh, publication and airing. Rubric.com offers something similar. It is a model where review, the author pays, the reviewers are paid, and again, it's not so much that publish, that, that the paper be published, but rather where it gets published. The Peerage of Science is a very similar model with a number of journals that subscribe to the peerage. Authors submit a, subscript, a, a manuscript Peers voluntarily engage in the review processes once the paper is available online and submit peerage essays. Interestingly enough, there then follows a period where reviewers peer review each other's reviews. The authors and editors of the journals that subscribe to the peerage are tracking the process throughout and ultimately the authors are offered a place for publication of their journal. And notice that the entire process is taking a very few weeks. Biomed Central offers something very similar. Again, the stress is on transparency with regard to who the peers are. And the founder of Biomed Central has recently launched the Faculty of a Thousand Research Journal. And this is interesting because he believes that to delay publication is criminal, his word. And so he proceeds to publication online within a matter of days. And then the paper is available for post-publication peer review. Our post-publication peer review really is creating what exists in every clinical department, in every research laboratory, that is to say, a journal club. So it is these virtual journal clubs that are being established. Journallab.com uh, is one such model. There are others, and some of you in the audience may have direct experience with those. So if I look now at this modern and peer review into the future, what, and apply the benchmarks of Richard Smith, what can we make of it? Well, certainly it's faster. I suspect it's still expensive because of the time, certainly, of the reviewers. It's more efficient. Innovation ought not to be blocked, given the bias to publication. But I think it, the bias might still be apparent. And we heard today of the paper published just this month in Science, Who's Afraid of Peer Review? A paper very deliberately peppered with scientific error and only the PLOS journal was able to find those errors and to reject the paper. And worse, we've heard also of the predatory publications and this same article reports on authors who have believed in the existence of these journals and have gone so far as to be tricked into paying author processing fees into these non-existent spaces. So it seems to me that the future is upon us, certainly, that the internet permits that, but that we're still in a process of steady evolution. That we have open peer review, that it is a good thing, but it is yet to be made good. 
And Richard Horton, who edits The Lancet, in speaking to the UK Parliament about peer review, suggested that this evolution continues and what we'll, we shall eventually see is a combination of pre and post publication peer review that makes continuous but constructive criticism a new norm of science. And I think then we shall have achieved what Richard Smith called the blessing. The blessing upon the authors, for that really is the service that scientists do for their fellow scientists and for society as a whole. And perhaps then our authors will feel a little less battered, a little less bruised by the process of peer review. Thank you for your attention.